other people in need this morning. You need to get your mind off yourself, but when you isolate, the conduct of your trouble is very, is very easily seen here. He isolates himself, and he tells his servant, just get lost. Who knows what happened to the servant? You need the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and by the way, you need the right kind of fellowship. There's a difference in horses and donkeys. Hope you know that. When horses are threatened and they get together, like out west here, you can have some wild horses and stuff. They get together, what they'll do is they'll all get together inwardly and their faces will face inwardly and they'll kick outwardly. They say donkeys, when they get threatened, they'll back up and kick each other. And so if you get around the wrong people in your depressed state, you're just going to be kicked all around. You need to be around the right people, the right fellowship, those people that are going to build you up, those people that are going to encourage you. Maybe you're not at a place now where you can pull somebody up. Maybe you need somebody to be pulling you up. So you see the conduct, you see some of these things that are happening, isolation. You know, these branches fall off trees. We have them in our place, you know, we have storms and, and things like that. And branches fall off the trees and sometimes they'll still have some of the leaves on the trees. If you leave a branch laying on the ground for a while, eventually the leaves will turn brown and just drop off of it. If you take that branch after it falls off and you go and you plant it down in the ground, you stick it down in the ground, nothing's going to happen. Those branches were made to be attached. And God made the body of Christ to be attached. You're not supposed to have a hand chopped off over there and an elbow chopped off over there and an earlobe chopped off over there. It's supposed to be attached. If you're isolating yourself, that is a sign of this depression that's coming in and you better notice it. You better watch it. The conduct of his trouble, notice isolation, verse number two. Notice verse number four, introspection. Verse number four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Introspective, what does that mean? That means he's just thinking of himself. That's egotism. Egotism leads one to consider everything in its relation to himself instead of everything in relation to God and others. You've heard the old acronym JOY. You want to have joy in your life? J-O-Y. Jesus first, others next, yourselves last. If you're not doing that, you will not have joy. So it's not just isolation, it's introspection. He's at Juniper Junction. I was doing some research for this and I studied that and the, as far as people on antidepressants and so forth, women, the highest percentage of women in the United States that are on antidepressants is in the state of Utah. Is in the state of Utah. And I think the reason is because of all of the pressures in Mormonism on performance for the wife. Now, can I go ahead and just say this as far as Bible believers? There's pressure. And there's good pressure. We need good, positive peer pressure. You need some pressure to come to church and try to win a soul for Christ and read your Bible and learn and study. We need that. But you better be real careful with that pressure that it's not a thing to where you're just like one of the brothers mentioned, just comparing yourselves among others. And you're just trying to keep up and you're trying to keep up and you find yourself in this position to where what you're doing is really for yourself and not for the Lord. Because you don't want to be the oddball. You don't want to be made fun of. It's not really for Jesus. It's really for everybody else. But it's really not for everybody else. It's just so you don't feel left out. It's just so you don't look bad. You maintain your spirituality, your outward spirituality, just so everybody thinks you're spiritual. And that's where Elijah's at. He's at a place where it's all about him. And that pressure has gotten him to that point. These are signs. You say, preacher, I'm doing good. I'm not at Juniper Junction. Well, maybe not. Maybe so. Maybe so. Now, for Elijah, you know what was and what he saw? 
the opposition was way too strong for him. That's what he saw. That's why he ran. His flesh was too weak. The journey was too great. And we'll see in just a little bit, the distractions were too many. These things, this little molehill became a mountain in his life. And he was at the Depression Depot. And he got to a place, he just said, I just want to be over. I just want to end it. Look, you need to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ if you hear them talk that way. And by the way, you hear somebody talk that way, you don't need to take it lightly. Especially you hear a young person talk that way, you, need to, you don't take it lightly. You don't just say, oh, get over it. No, you take it seriously. Because by the time, typically, by the time someone has enough courage, or maybe they don't even care at this point, to say that they are about ready to take their life, they're pretty close to doing it. And let me say this. There are plenty of Bible believers that have taken their life. Amen. And let me go ahead and help you with your doctrine in case you don't know this. Suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Somebody takes their life, it doesn't mean they've lost their salvation. Okay. You just need to understand that. I can't tell you how many times I've had people ask me that. That is a very common misnomer. One of the great examples in the Bible is Samson. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he, he brought the, the house down on top of him. And he's in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the heroes of the faith. Sometimes people can't take the pressure. And all they see, their reality is a false reality. It's a pseudo-reality. And that's where Elijah finds himself. You see the conduct of his trouble, isolation and introspection. Now let's look at the cure of his trouble. Here's the prescription found in the Scriptures. Notice verses 5-7. through seven. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Here's God's cure. You say, what's God's cure? Well, you see it right in the passage, a touch. First of all, a touch. And might I say it's a gentle touch. Psalm 18, verse 35, David said this, Thy gentleness hath made me great. I want to give you a few verses here. You might jot them down. Somebody quoted this earlier. One of the preachers did. 1 John 3, 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Psalm 42, 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. There's hope and there's encouragement. Here we see not just Elijah trying to do something for God. God in his mercy is going to do something for Elijah. And I want to encourage you here this afternoon. I know you think nobody knows what you're going through. I know you think no other Bible believers might be going through what you're going through. Certainly not a preacher's going through what you're going through. Certainly not one of the heroes of your faith are going through what you're going through. Certainly nobody understands. I want to let you know that God understands and God cares. Amen. And there is a prescription from God to help your troubled soul. Hey, God will do something for you. Hey, if God can save your soul from hell, don't you think he can help you in a place of depression, in a place of despondency, in a place where you're ready to end it all? Yes, he can. Man might not can, but God can. You might not can, but God can. There's hope for Elijah. There's hope. Man, you would think it would be over at this point. Elijah says, man, I just want to die. Now, the funny thing is this. Elijah, if you really wanted to die... Why didn't you just stay back in town and let Jezebel take care of it for you? Jezebel would have made it quick and painless. Well, she probably wouldn't have made it. It would have probably been painful. But see, what that shows is oftentimes some of the emotions really betray the real intent of what's going on. You see. Notice the cure for his trouble, a touch, a gentle touch. You know, the Lord's trying to bless us, not beat us. I hope you don't see God as some type of demagogue. 
I hope you understand the difference in conviction and condemnation. I'm not here. My job is not to beat you over the head with the Bible. My job is... Uh, Dr. Peacock would say oftentimes is not to put a scope on it and take you out. As Brother Lynch used to say, you can only skin the sheep one time and then they're dead. I'm not here to skin the sheep. And God is not trying to beat you up. He's trying to bless you. He's not trying to fleece you. He's trying to feed you. He's not trying to lure you. He's trying to lead you. He's not trying to confuse things. He's trying to clarify things. He knows what we are. He made us. He says, I know your butt dust. (laughs) He pities us. I'm not giving you a license to sin. Don't take this wrong. But the Lord knows, listen to me, the Lord knows you are going to fall. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. You're going to mess up. God says, when you do, I will pick you up. The the shame and disgrace is not falling. The shame and disgrace is staying down. The shame and disgrace for the prodigal would have been to stay in the pig pen and stay in the hog pen. The fact that he got up and said, I will arise and go to my father, that speaks volumes. He's willing to say, yeah, I messed up. I'm no good. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Well, come on home, son. None of us are worthy to be called His Son. And He knows that. He knows you're dealing with a sinful flesh. And some of you, can I say this? Some of you in your formative years, what a blessing for you young kids. And I appreciate the message this morning, man. He was cutting us up with the sword. I mean, you better live right or God will kill you. Woo! You ought to have the fear of God in your formative years, you young kids. You know what's going to happen if you stay right? God's going to protect you from getting hooked on some stuff. God's going to protect you from getting a whole lot of baggage. That even after you get saved and, and filled with the Holy Spirit, and even after you get the Bible right and dispensations right, if you got messed up in your previous life, that stuff's going to stay with you until the rapture. I'm telling you, you're going to have to fight it until Jesus comes. Yes. The best thing to do is don't get tangled up in stuff. The best thing to do is just flee away from sin. Have the courage like Joseph did. Have the courage to run from sin. Get away from it. Shy away from it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Because if you don't, I'm telling you, it'll take you down. It'll take you further than you want to go. Some of you, you kick yourself all over the place. God knows the struggles you have. God knows what you've got to deal with and His blood still has the power to give you the victory. And though that giant be in your life, there's still victory in Jesus Christ and God can get glory when you let Him have the victory. Man, what a blessing when those strongholds are pulled down. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? To the pulling down of strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a position the devil takes. It's kind of like ground. It's like when you study the Civil War. Obviously, the Northerners, they came in, and they, very early their navy was very superior to the Confederates, and they took a lot of ground very early on. And a lot of the ground they took on, like in Mobile and some of the other ports, they, they had the whole war. They never gave that ground back. There are a few battles where the Yankees came in and took some ground, and the Confederates would come out, and they'd beat them, and they'd take the ground over. Then later on, with more troops and all those things, they'd come back and take the ground. But a lot of time, the ground that the Northerners took, they kept the ground, and they just kept moving and kept marching. And they got Sherman, and they said, Come on, man, let's finish this thing. Let's just keep marching. That's what the devil does. See, he gets a little bit of ground, and then he has a stronghold. He sets it up there. Then he wants to take a little bit more. Then he wants you to go just a little bit further, a little bit further. And he takes more and more ground. But the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can give you the victory over those giants. And when he does, you know what? Just like the preacher preached, God can get some glory. So I want to encourage you. Some of you got some baggage. You got it. Don't let it define you. I'm crucified with Christ. 
For to me to live is Christ. Paul the apostle had some baggage in his life. He had killed people. He had murdered Christians. And he's preaching to their family members. Don't you know that haunted him? But he was able to say, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. How did he do it? I think he did it every day. I think every day he put on his uniform. Every day he put on his uniform, he looked at his name tag. And his name tag said, Christian. I'm not a persecutor of Christians. I am a Christian. I'm not what I used to be in my past. I am a blood-washed son of God. Your identification in Jesus Christ means the world. Notice this touch. It's a gentle touch. Notice it's an awakening touch. Man, he's exhausted, verse number five. He slides under that juniper tree, and he crashes. He falls out. You ever been so sleepy you fell asleep standing up? I've done that a couple of times. Hospitals and things like that. Leaning against the door, you know, and you like, whoa. Talking about the Civil War, I was reading about some uh, 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 Bedford Forrest. He was brutal in uh, uh, some of the uh, things that he led and so forth. Actually, no, this is uh, Stonewall Jackson's uh, uh, marches. He would march some of those guys 20 and 30 miles. And then when they get to the line of battle, in other words, that line, you got the enemy over there and you're standing there shooting at them. When they get to the line of battle, they would be so tired, the bullets are flying by their head and some of them are falling asleep. They're just, they're completely exhausted. They've been marching 30 miles in their bare feet through the night. And then they're standing there having to fight and they're just, they're wiped out. I can't believe he fell asleep in church. That was the greatest message in the world, and he was snoozing. Well, brother so-and-so has a very complicated heart problem, and he's on this certain type of medication that you just didn't know that, you smart aleck. You punk. Maybe one day when you get a little age on you, and you get a few aches and pains, I can't believe they couldn't come back to church. Okay. We'll see how all that washes out in the judgment seat of Christ. I think at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be quality over quantity. Yes. 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 I don't care how many times you read the Bible. I care less. I'm ashamed at how many times I've read it, not because I hadn't read it a few times, because I've read it a lot and I should be a better Christian. Quant quality. Quality. Notice this gentle touch, and notice it's an awakening touch. He was just so exhausted, he fell asleep. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Notice not just a gentle touch, an awakening touch. Notice verse number 7, after he feeds him a little bit, and he comes and he touches him. Look at verse 7, a second time. You know what? We need a second touch. We need a second touch. Look, I know I'm saved, and I know I have the Holy Spirit, but you know what? You need a second touch. You need God to do something for you. You know, you need an answer to prayer. You need something real. You can say, you know what? That's a promise that I'm holding on to right there. And I'm praying for this, and I'm asking God for this, and you need the Lord to do something for you. A second touch. You know, the Lord didn't love him any less than when he called down the fire from heaven. When you study the story of the prodigal son, the... The father always loved the prodigal. Amen. And I think he had already forgiven him. His forgiveness was not based on how many tears he cried and how big the crocodile tears were and how quote-unquote repentant he was. The father ran to him before he even knew what the son was going to say. God's forgiveness is there. It's waiting for you. It's an awakening touch. It's a gentle touch. It's a second touch. But he didn't just need a touch. Notice in verse number eight, uh, in verse number 6, he needed a taste. He needed a taste. Man, there's another one of those hoe cakes. Another one of those hoe cakes with some black eyed peas and collard greens. Cake, bacon on the coals, coals. He needed a taste. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, the Lord fed him with the ravens. He fed him with a woman with just had two sticks and she's gathering up for her son to die. Now he feeds him with this angel. And he wants him to get a taste. You know, you need to get a taste. That book right there is the, the manna from God. And God says, look, I know you're wore out. I know you're tired. I know you're probably not going to read 15 or 20 chapters, but maybe just open up here to the book of Psalms here. 
You just need a little taste. And you know, when people get sick and they get really, really sick, maybe some of you have grandparents or, or parents or folks that you know that are they're in maybe those latter stages and they begin to get to a place to where they lose their appetite. And when people get really, really sick and close to death, they won't eat anymore. God says, hey man, it ain't time to quit. It's time to eat. You need a little taste. Well, I'm not, just, I'm not very hungry, you know. Well, just here, here's a little saltine cracker. Just, just put this, eat that little saltine cracker. Or my favorite, you know, get a Ritz cracker. <laughs> Nothing better than a Ritz cracker with some peanut butter on it. Amen. Come on. And a good apple. Sweet apple. Eat that apple, eat that cracker. <laughs> it's almost good as a saltine cracker with mayonnaise on top of it. <laughs> Come on! No takers, no takers. Man, y'all eat kimchi. And you're talking. Saltine cracker and mayonnaise, kimchi eaters. I can't remember. When I first came here years ago, man, I'm looking around. Y'all are putting kimchi on everything. Spaghetti, kimchi. Eggs, kimchi. Soup, kimchi. You need saltines and Duke's mayonnaise. I don't know if y'all have Duke's mayonnaise here. Saltine and mayonnaise, that's what you need. But you know what the prescription is? God says, hey, I'm going to touch you. I'm going to touch you. Maybe it's in a meeting like this. Maybe it's with the songs. Maybe it's with a message. Maybe it's with a brother or sister just praying with you. You ever have somebody pray for you? And man, God just reaches down and they touch you. And you just need a taste. Just grab that verse. Maybe it's the verses you're memorizing. Just read it and eat it and taste it and see if it might get your appetite up just a little bit. Yeah. Not just a touch, not just a taste, but notice as verses 8 to 14, there's a test. There's a test. He comes. Notice in verse number 8, He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Just like Moses, just like Elijah, I mean, just like the Lord Jesus, we know that's why he's one of the two witnesses. Verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here in this condition? That's the question. It's not the physical locality as much as it is the condition that the prophet's in. What are you doing here? And Elijah tells him, and you know he doesn't get the test right because when he, the Lord keeps asking him and he gives him the same answer over and over. You see the Lord's question. He's getting Elijah to face himself. The hardest part with this whole thing, dealing with Juniper Junction, dealing with Depression Depot, is to be honest enough to face yourself. And say, hey, I need some help, Lord. I'm not as strong as I let on to be. I'm not as mighty and as spiritual as everybody thinks I am. I've got some sin problems and I, I've got some heartache problems and Lord, I, I'm in a mess. I, I'm under the juniper tree, Lord. The Lord's question. You know, God has better questions than we do explanations. Elijah's answer is really only a there's a, there's a quarter of what he says is false. You'll notice here he says a couple of things wrong, but notice that he says, I'm the only one. We know the Lord tells him later on, I've got 7,000. But notice what he says in his response. Look at the end of it. I, even I, only am left. Let me go ahead and kick this dog. We are Bible believers. And the danger in getting the, all the doctrine and all the knowledge is knowledge puffeth up. Yes. And pretty soon you get, your head gets so big it can't, you can't walk out the door. It won't even fit through those double doors. 
And you think you're the only one on the job that loves Jesus because you know how to rightly divide. You're the only one in your family that really loves Jesus because you know all about the tribulation and all about the uh, prophecies in the book of Revelation. You're the only one because you are a King James Bible believer. Let me just go ahead and say this. There are some people out there, and you're going to think I'm a heretic for saying this. They don't have their Bible right but they love the Lord right. Yes. You might have your Bible right, but you don't love the Lord right. Yes. Who cares if you got the King James Bible right? Who cares if you rightly divide right when your heart ain't right? Yes. I'm the only one. Everybody else is a heretic. Maybe so, maybe not. Some people just haven't been exposed to the truth that you've been exposed to. Maybe if they grew up along the lines that you did, maybe if they were taught, maybe they believed the same things. But maybe they're doing more with what they have than what you're doing. To whom much is given, much is required. So this pride that comes in, you see that selfishness, that egotism, that isolation, that introspection, that is a sign that you're at Juniper Junction. Notice also in that same portion, he says, I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life. They thought it was Jezebel. He's done turned this thing into the entire nation. Everybody's against him. All the other Bible believers are against me because I'm the only one that doesn't have a Christmas tree. I'm the only one that's spiritual enough. Really? If, if that's all you got to preach, I pity the, I pity the fool. Pity the fool. But he's done turned this thing where it's me against them. That's what happens when you get in this cycle in this bad place. It's, it's everybody's against you and you don't realize the people that you think against you are really trying to help you many times. They seek my life. I'm going to write a book one day. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm going to write a book one day, because we always use that they. I'm going to write a book, who is, who is they? <laughs> who is they? Amen. They, they are always out to get us. Yeah. Well, you know, next time, well, come November, I know what they're going to do. <laughs> who is they? <laughs> and see, he's done turned this thing to this big scheme, this big conspiracy. You know what? There's a conspiracy behind the conspiracies. Boy, he's done worked himself. You need a touch. You need a taste. There's a test. The Lord gives you an answer, and the answer is, here comes the earthquake and the fire, and the Lord's not in that stuff. Verses 11 and 12. The Lord's not in the spectacular. If you're only here for the mountaintop experience of camp, just like has been preached, you're not going to make it down in the valley. If you're only about the, the results of the Lord passing by, that's what it is. Don't mistake, like we talked about before, don't mistake the provision for the provider. Yeah, that's good. And don't get confused with the results of God passing by. We need God. Whether the results are the earthquake, whether the results are the fire, whether it's people shouting and jumping up, and by the way, it's not how high you jump, it's how you land. So it's not in the spectacular. It's in the still small voice. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. You probably know the verse, but here's just a small part of the verse. He says this, question. For who hath despised the day of small things? I would ask, I think we could summarize the question as you think about these quote unquote spectacular things. Here's the question. Is God in that? Is God in that? The Lord asked him again, what are you doing here? Verse 14, he says the same thing. I'm the only one. They seek my life to take it away. God's ministering to Elijah with a still small voice. Notice verse number 15, the Lord said, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. 
And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphet of Abel Mahola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. It shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kiss, kissed him. There's a task to do. There's not just a touch, not just a taste, not just a test, but there's a task. You see, the Lord's not finished with the prophet yet. Now I think there's probably some symbolism here. This is a three and a half year ministry, and God says, I want you to go anoint somebody else. It's like, okay, I'm breaking this thing at three and a half, and you're going to finish it in the tribulation. There's your three and a half stuff to fight over afterwards. <laughs> but let's look at it in a positive sense. He says, look, Elijah, there's some stuff here for you to do. Before you throw in the towel, before you say, oh, take my life away from me, I'm not worthy. And before you say, God, kill me, I've got some stuff for you to do. I'm not done with you yet. I've got a task for you to do. The psychologists, they even have this mentality. They say everybody to have a stable mental well-being, they need someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Man, as a Christian, we've got all three. <laughs> we've got the Lord Jesus to love. We've got our brothers and sisters in Christ to love, a lost world to love. We've got something to do. God's got all of you in your place to do something. And boy, we've got something to look forward to. Man, you might think that the curtain's about to fall, but really the sun's about to rise. You might think it's getting dark, but man, it's going to get brighter and brighter. Man, when that trumpet sounds and that thing, that blast goes off, you're going to hear that voice come up hither, and in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, we're out of here. Man, we got something to look forward to. Don't be so despondent and so discouraged and kick yourself and say, hey, I can't do anything. I'm not called to preach and I don't have a great singing voice and I'm not very outgoing and I can't. Quit looking at your have-nots and look what God can do with you. God's not done with you. I don't care how low you might feel. I don't care how depressed you might be. I don't care if you checked out at Juniper Junction today. God's got something for you to do for Him. Amen. And in the end, when that giant falls flat on his face, God will get the glory for it. Amen. Elijah learned at the end, verse 18, he's not alone. Who are you? Only one? No, there's 7,000 more. And it's amazing here when you think about the man who wished himself to die. You know what? There he was under that juniper tree. There he was at Depression Depot. And you know how he goes out, man. He's the only man that goes out this way. The chariot of fire comes down. And he goes up in a whirlwind. And get this, we'll get to that tomorrow. He's got a legacy to pass behind. You see, not only do you have a mentor in front of you to look to, but you've got somebody beside you. There's 7,000 of you. You might not realize there are, but there are. And they're beside you. They're going along in the traces. And there's some Elishas behind you. And they're watching you. They're watching you and they're following you. God's got something for you to do. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't say, God, kill me. Say, God, let me live. And live your life for Jesus Christ. It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it not to give up, not to quit. Louis L'Amour, I probably gave you this one time before. He was a famous uh, Western author, and he was a great author. A lot of the old John Wayne movies and stuff like that are based on some of his books. And he said, there will come a time when you will believe everything is finished. Especially with an author, you think, oh, I can't write anything. There will come a time when you believe everything is finished. That will be the beginning. That will be the beginning. You ever read a novel, read a book, and you go through there, and maybe you get to a chapter, and man, here's the hero and the heroine, and everything is just looking really, really bad. And you're thinking by the end of this chapter, you know, there's no way they're going to get out of this. But that's just one little chapter in the book. Your life story is not over yet. Don't give up. 
Don't quit. You say, well, I'm in a very low place. That's okay. God will pull you up. Yes. God will get you out of Juniper Junction. He'll get you out of Depression Depot if you'll let him. Lord, I pray you bless your people. Lord, give us grace. We need grace and help from on high in Jesus' name.